Hi, it's Simon here from Analog Anorak. On today's video, I'm looking at the classical music releases on the RCA Red Label. Now, this has already been covered from the North American perspective by channels such as The Pressing Matters and Vinyl Bliss. But I want to add to these by giving the lowdown on some of the UK pressings of these records. So I'm going to combine a personal top five from the pressings that I've picked up over the years with a bit of an overview about the UK pressings. It's far from a definitive top five. The records that I've picked up have generally just I've, have generally just been ones that I've come across in record shops and charity shops. And it's only the number one spot where I actually sort out a recording because of its strong audiophile credentials. Hopefully the overview might give some pointers if you are interested in collecting some of the UK pressings. I've chosen this top five from quite a large range of recordings, mainly picking out the best sounding ones, but also taking into account the recordings that I listen to the most. I think it's important to explain first why there are differences between the American pressings and the UK pressings. These differences all stem from 1955. RCA changed their distribution contract from EMI records to DECA. But this new contract took into account the really high reputation DECA was getting for the quality of its recordings and its ability to capture the acoustics of the venues in the UK and Europe. The contract also covered cooperation between the two labels with recordings. So with some of the recordings, there is the involvement sometimes of DECA engineers and equipment, sometimes producers, but also the use of the venues. This arrangement was to the benefit of RCA and DECA. This formal contract continued for about 10 years and was extremely productive. When the contract ended in the 1960s, by that point, the results had been so positive and some very strong links formed between the staff that the arrangement did continue relatively informally as a kind of amicable divorce. I have noticed on some of the comments on previous videos that there is quite a high level of interest in the US about the RCA UK pressings because it is well known how the quality of the recording and mastering with DECA remained high well beyond the point where the legendary RCA Indianapolis pressings were followed by much more mediocre pressings. This is an example of the UK red label pressings from the 50s and you can see that and you can see why these are known as the silver spot uh, pressings and it was on this label where initially the uk pressings of the living stereo label were produced and most of the time there were very similar album covers so i'll show you my number five and one of the things that is disappointing but understandable is that records like this with the clear living with the clear living stereo banner rarely stay for long in charity shops they nearly always quickly make their way in onto the internet sales and ebay and it's only once in a blue moon that i come across something like this in the wild and most of the time, the reason why it's still there is that the actual vinyl is so beaten up that it's unplayable. So to get hold of early pressings of UK living stereos, you have to resort to the internet. And the prices, understandably, tend to start from about £20 onwards. Most of the less desired recordings are in the 20 to 40 pounds region. But if you look for some of the legendary living stereos like Witch's Brew or Venice, you're talking about several hundred pounds to get a good copy. Because this was recorded in the US, the only part of, the only part of Decca's involvement was the mastering and production of the vinyl in the UK. And the quality of these records 
is very dependent on the quality of the tapes that were sent over to the UK. The most sought after UK pressings of living stereos are the ones that were recorded by Decca in the UK or Europe. This is partly down to the quality of their recording techniques, but also they were far more likely to use the master tapes or a very good copy for these early pressings. I've got to admit for number five, if I hadn't made a whole video already about my copy of the Martinon Shostakovich living stereo, it probably would have been my choice at number five, but this one I really like. It scores really high as far as the quality of the performance with a live performance by Van Kleiben and Kondrashin at Carnegie Hall from 1958. The Sonics are acceptable and the quality of the pressing is reasonable. The tax code on the, on the disc does indicate that it was around 1965 when this was made. So it, it's one of the less beat up ones and it can stand being played on a modern revealing stereo cartridge. I've got to admit another reason why I really like listening to this recording is it's a far less distracting experience than when I first ever listened to this recording on the CD box set. The CD version of this concert unfortunately is too revealing recording the sounds from the audience and particularly the first movement, the sheer amount of coughing and the distraction from this really makes the experience quite hard going. In contrast, the balance between the sounds of the music and performance compared with the audience, it, the audience sounds are there, but much more in the background and it's a far easier listen and highly enjoyable. One of the delights that I've discovered about the red label RCA pressings has been looking at the later pressings from the 1970s. When these pressings involved the whole Decca chain from recording to mastering, they very much resemble the best of the Ace of Diamonds label. And what you get is this really nice combination of improved cutting lathe technology with the charm of some of the early recordings on repressing. As we go into the 1960s and 70s, with many of the vintage recordings no longer being pressed on the red label, and it only tends to be certain select artists, often the really most popular ones, whose, whose earlier recordings stay on the red label. Some notable examples are Rubenstein, Andre Previn, Julian Bream, and a little bit later, the flute juggernaut, James Galway. Unfortunately, the RCA UK pressings from this period share the notorious Decca in a sleeve plastic. And because of this, it is really helpful to inspect these records to see if there are any signs of the inner sleeve bonding. And on some occasions, you realize that unfortunately, the record is toast as you can't even get it out of the inner sleeve. Fortunately, most of the time, the amount of contact is slight and it, just foot, and it tends to just raise the sound floor. So if we look at the label of number four, it's a very different style of label from the 70s. And I understand there is a similar label in the US, but I think it also includes Nipper the Dog. So the artist in question is Rubenstein playing Chopin's Piano Concerto number no. one. This was a UK based recording from 1961. And the venue was Walthamstow Assembly Halls, which was very similar in acoustics to Kingsway Hall, but not quite as spectacular. With this recording, there was an RCA producer, Max Wilcox. And from the Decca side, the engineer was the legendary Ken Wilkinson. Also on the production team was a relatively young Charles Gerhardt, who was just learning his craft at that particular point in time. And intermittently, he continued to work with Ken Wilkinson on RCA and Reader's Digest recordings for nearly 20 years. My understanding is that the atmosphere on the recordings involving 
Decca engineers and Decca engineers and RCA producers were a lot more relaxed and enjoyable to all involved than the more formal arrangements when it was all Decca staff. I certainly can't say I'm a fan of all of Rubenstein's recordings, but this performance is just wonderful with such subtlety and restraint, it's a joy to listen to. Ken Wilkinson achieves a beautifully balanced recording and the quality of the cutting head technology further enhances the sound. And this particular piece of vinyl got off lightly as far as the inner sleeve and has a very low sound floor. The records that come in at three and two are by the same artist, Julian Bream. And I've got to admit, I was spoiled for choice as far as quality Julian Bream UK vinyl. I think part of this was timing as his early career coincided with the golden age of stereo and mono recordings. And at position three, I'm going to feature a stereo recording, whereas at number two, I'm going to feature a mono version of one of his solo instrument albums. Most of the RCA UK recordings did use Decca engineers and equipment, but there were occasions where they would seek out alternative, more freelance arrangements. And a few of these, particularly from the early years, are really good and have made it into my top five at the expense of Decca. As the years go by with RCA UK pressings, the number of sonically appealing discs does reduce. I think partly due to the period of Dynagroove, but also the increasing use of multi-miking. And this impacts on the Julian Bream later recordings where the performances are superb, but the sound of the recording is less charming and really quite harsh and, and, really quite, and can be really quite harsh on the ear. The two Julian Bream stereo recordings up there were very strong contenders for the top spot, but it's actually this freelance recording which shock horror is Dynagroove that for me just pips them to the post. So the recording in question took place in 1963, again at Walthamstow Assembly Halls. This 1960s pressing has the characteristic black spot and the recording in question is this one, which scores highly with me as far as the repertoire. On side one, you've got Bream's version of the Rodrigo Guitar Concerto, accompanied by the Melos Ensemble. On side two, there is a lovely selection from Britain's Gloriana, accompanied by the Bream Consort. And there's a gorgeous version of the Vivaldi Lute Concerto. And movement two, I've got to admit, gets me every time. As far as the Dynagroove issue, the involvement of Decca from the mastering perspective is very helpful. I understand that the engineers soon got word that people, that the public were not happy with the Dynagroove recordings. So the mastering engineers took the approach of trying their best to get a good sounding record despite the impact of the Dynagroove process. And I think this was in contrast to the pressings in the US where the whole Dynagroove process was fully embraced. This early pressing I'm sure also benefits from the mastering engineer being the legendary Ted Burkett who was definitely on form and you only very intermittently get any sense of the Dynagroove process with, the just, sl with just short lived periods of harshness in the treble. This was my first Julian Bream record, and for ages I thought it was actually engineered by Decca. I found out much later that it was actually engineered by a man called Alan Stagg. In the 1960s, he worked for IBC Studios, which was the biggest independent studio in the UK in the 60s. His major love was classical recording. And his whole philosophy seems very much in keeping with the Decker approach, which is probably why it sounds so Deckery. He definitely favoured the philosophy of less is more as far as the number of microphones being used. His later career was very different with him moving much more into a management position and he became the head managing 
engineer at Abbey Road. Comments from rock groups and rock engineers from Abbey Road in that period is, is very negative about Alan Stagg, mainly from, mainly from quite a lot of friction that was going on. But if you look back in the, into the 1960s, the feedback from the junior engineers that he worked with at IBC is actually really quite positive. I think this mainly stems from some really quite pioneering work he did at that time as far as how to train engineers. Rather than the style used at EMI and DECA of the apprenticeship where young engineers would just help out and watch, Stagg introduced much more sophisticated teaching using workshop principles where a certain recording scenario would be presented and within certain restrictions the solution had to be made. Alan Stagg certainly wasn't one of the great engineers from the golden period but this really does sound impressive and is one of his best recordings. It has to be really to edge out those two other marvellous recordings. But at the end of the day, I listen to this recording far more often than those two, which is why it gets number three spot. Over the years, I have picked up quite a number of RCA mono recordings, but I think it's only in the area of small scale recordings or solo recordings where mono versions really compete well with the stereo versions. Monos can be wonderful in that they're often in really good condition. They go for a fraction of the price and with solo instruments, they, they can produce stunning results. These two Julian Bream solo albums over my shoulder are, both, are again wonderful albums. But there was one clear winner which is one of the best mono records I have. And it's this one, it's Popular Classics for the Spanish Guitar. This was recorded in 1964 and, and the stereo version originally came out as a living stereo. The venue used was relatively unique in that it was in the library at Kenwood House, which was in Hampstead, London. This library had a very ornate plaster dome ceiling and also had the impact of all of the leather bound books on the walls and it proved to be a wonderful venue for small scale recordings. The version I have is another 60s black spot and it is an early pressing probably from 1964. I would say if you want to buy just one Julian Bream solo recording this is the one to get. It has just such a wonderful repertoire including works by Albineth, Fire and Tarina. It's beautifully played. This is one of the rare solo instrument albums that you can happily sit down and listen to both sides without things sounding a bit repetitive or samey. The sonics are glorious with this recording. And again, this was actually a case of RCA going down the freelance route with the equipment and with the equipment and engineering coming from Pi Records. At this time, Pi had the only mobile recording van, which might have been one of the reasons why they got the gig, but they were very fortunate in getting the engineer Bob Auger. Now, around this time, Bob Auger is best known for his work at Pi Studios with the Kinks, and he engineered nearly all of those wonderful early seminal recordings. But interspersed between kink sessions, he was also utilised to go out and do classical recordings for, for Pi as well. Bob Auger continued to do some classical recording for RCA well into the 70s, and ultimately his approach was very much towards multi-miking. But at this particular point in time, he was still very much under the influence from his experience assisting Bob Fine from Mercury Records. Pi had managed to put out in the UK the very first stereo classical recordings and they were rubbish and the critical reception was savage and they had to go very much back to the drawing board and part of this was, was getting an arrangement with Mercury Records which had already got a really good reputation. 
Pi Records started to put out some of the US recordings, they also cooperated with the very earliest UK sessions where Bob Fine and Wilma Cozart came over with the famous Mercury van to the UK and did recordings mainly in London but a few in Manchester as well. Bob Auger was called in to help assist Bob Fine and what he got from this experience led to him using three microphones in a very similar arrangement as Bob Fine used and his choice of favouring the U47 microphone probably came from this experience too. So in a way for this recording we have to thank two Bobs for the wonderful sonics that we've been left with. So for my number one choice you might be surprised to hear that it's a late RCA pressing. It's this recording and you can see the label I'll show on close up it's a slightly larger label than the Decker equivalent and the recording in question is this one. What's wonderful about this recording is that this is unmistakably old school. The recording was made at Kingsway Hall in 1977 and it was pressed in early 1978. I understand that there is a US Indianapolis pressing of this recording but I haven't been able to find out how good that pressing is. I am aware that the UK pressing is on the absolute sounds list. The US version does have the title The French Touch which is a bit confusing because they use the same title for a much earlier living stereo collection. It featured from the RCA side Charles Gerhardt who I mentioned earlier who by this point was going on a career arc which had started off as a recording engineer moved on to production and he was and he was evolving into conducting himself. He had developed over nearly 20 years a really good working relationship with the Decca engineer Ken Wilkinson and away from the prying eyes of Arthur Haddy who liked very strict formal divisions between producer and engineer Gerhardt and Wilkinson did have a much more collaborative way, way of working and it produced wonderful results not just for RCA recordings but for a mass of Reader's Digest recordings some of which are absolute legends. The orchestra they used is a bit of an unusual one it's the National Philharmonia Orchestra this orchestra mainly existed just for recording sessions by, by RCA and it was a kind of all-stars collaboration of past and present members from various orchestras in London. Wilkinson's career was only a few years away from his retirement and it might have been partly to mark the end of an era that Gerhardt decided to offer to Wilkinson the opportunity not just to engineer the recording but to produce it as well and Wilkinson seized this opportunity. It wouldn't have worried him at all as in the 30s and 40s it was just how things were done. He had lots of experience of doing both roles from the 30s and 40s before the creation of the role of producer became important but I think the collaboration between the two again is the key to what's so wonderful about this recording. For me I love this style of music so it's an absolute delight to have an, to have an album of Sarti, Foray and three classics from Ravel and I find all of these pieces are strong on performance and awe-inspiring as far as sonics and it's like a wonderful banquet with a succession of sonic delights throughout the whole album. I was a little bit worried on first listening whether the, the sumptuous sonics would mean that the Ravel Pavan would go in the way of being a little bit slushy and flabby but the performance keeps well away from those risks and it, it, it still is a distinctly Ravel like piece. Although I've always enjoyed Tombo de Couperin it's never been one of my favourites before but when I first heard this rendition it instantly became my favoured version. In the past with other versions I've sometimes found my mind wandering when listening to this piece but the performance 
makes it so easy to follow the entire piece. The version of Introduction and Allegro is also wonderful. It is very strong competition to the Melos Ensemble's version, which is legendary. It not only betters it as far as performance, but there are some stunning sonics from the harp with such beauty, presence and sweep of the, the sound of the, the harp. There are lots of credits on the album to the solo stars, as well as Gerhardt and Wilkinson. And, the com and there are some comments about the recording too. They, they clarify that all takes were recorded directly to two track tape approved by the players and conductor during the sessions. And these original tapes were used to cut the master discs without further studio processing. Music to my ears. So I hope you can see that although there are definitely no living stereo bargains in the UK, there are quite a few little gems that can be picked up mostly quite cheaply. So this top five is very much work in progress and I'll continue to try to dig out some hidden gems from this label. And if anybody has made any discoveries and any recommendations, please contribute to the comments section. Decca Records did get the rights back to quite a few RCA recordings and released them later on their own budget labels. Some of these recordings are really good. So I think it's likely I will do a video on those as well at some point in the future. But I hope you've enjoyed this. Take care. Bye.